Frankenstein is a story that's taken on a lot of meaning in our culture. It's often interpreted as a cautionary tale about scientific hubris. And to some extent, I think that's certainly true. Dr. Victor Frankenstein creates a living creature that the world has never seen before. He's intoxicated by the belief that he can do so, and he plows ahead without any forethought. But I think it's a mistake to see the novel as anti-science. I'd like to think that Mary, that Mary Shelley would have applauded um, Dr. Frankenstein's urge to create, to advance knowledge, um, to innovate. But once having created, he had certain obligations to care, to care for and nurture his creation. Instead, he abandons the creature, leaving it without shelter or comfort or care of any kind. Even when the creature explains how desperately lonely he is and begs Dr. Frankenstein to make him a mate, um, the scientist refuses. It's a tale that is certainly about irresponsible science, but also about lack of care and disregard for others. Those are my preliminary thoughts, and we're going to hear from experts from many different, several different disciplines in just a moment who are going to share their views about the meaning of the novel today. We have a terrific panel, and they're going to be introduced in just a moment. But since there are so many new people here, I'd really like to take a few minutes to tell you just a little bit about the Hastings Center and situate why, we, why would we focus on Frankenstein um, here in the middle of the Hastings Center. Um, we have two main goals. We aim to secure the just and compassionate care of people across the lifespan, from birth through death. And we aim to ensure the wise use of emerging technologies. What's wise? Well, it's another way of saying that we aim for justice, compassion, integrity, and stewardship in health and science policy and practice. We're a very small number of scholars here in Garrison, but we're augmented by 200 um, esteemed Hastings Fellows who are located around the country and around the world. Our staff scholars publish reports, books. If you want to see a sample of our books in the lounge at, during the reception in the far room on the left, there are all the books in that large cabinet are by Hastings scholars. We do policy briefs. Our scholars also know how to speak to the public and are expected to write op-eds and pieces that are accessible to the general public. And we are quoted in all of the, in all of the right places. Um, it's all with the purpose of ensuring responsible health and, po and science policy. And I don't think there's ever been a time when what we do has been needed more. There are advances in biology, in, life, in, um, in the physical sciences, and in information technologies that are all converging to create unbelievably transformative powers. We've entered an age of unprecedented medical, scientific, and technological prowess. We now have the power to literally change the human species and the planet itself. So as an example, take CRISPR-Cas9, and many of you may have read about this um, in the newspaper. It's a breakthrough. We've been doing genetic engineering for many, many years, but the CRISPR technology and some others that are fast on its heels are enabling us to do genetic engineering much more cheaply and easily so that it is incredibly accessible. And we are learning how to do this to the human genome, to human eggs, sperm, and embryos. And if that's done, it makes permanent heritable changes. It used to be that changes to the human genome represented a red line that we were not going to cross. We just said we're not going to do genetic engineering of ourselves. But there's a growing number of policymakers who now see that maybe that should be a yellow line or maybe even a green line. Um, because it's looking like we have the prospect of eradicating terrible conditions like sickle cell or other rare, or, or rare uh, genetic anomalies. And so there's growing support, but I wouldn't call it consensus yet, there's growing support for genome modification even in human beings, if it will eradicate terrible diseases. But it gets much more contentious when we move from eradicating disease to the idea of using genetic technologies to enhance ourselves, to make us better than normal. 
smarter or more athletic or even certain moral virtues like maybe more altruistic. Now the science isn't there yet, but it's getting closer. And in the near future, they're going to be, we're going to have a better sense of what the genetic predictors of those traits are. And when we do, there will be a heightened debate about whether we should change ourselves in those directions. So, in other words, we're going to have a lot, of, lot more knowledge and we're going to have a lot of questions about whether and how we should use it. The field of bioethics is what addresses those kind of questions and it's what uh, we do here at the Hastings Center and we're often credited with having started the field of bioethics. Um, and we exist to examine exactly those kinds of questions. Our scholars follow the work of scientists and policymakers, and then we weigh in through books and reports and all the ways that I've mentioned. Um, so in a way you could say the Hastings Center and bioethicists across the world um, provide oversight to ensure the wise use of this kind of knowledge. But not just bioethicists. Scientists themselves are another line of oversight and another way to ensure accountability. In 2015, one of the inventors of CRISPR-Cas9, Jennifer Dudna, did herself call for a moratorium. She said she was having nightmares about what this technology could do and she wanted to pause um, and, and call for a worldwide summit. She behaved exactly the opposite of Dr. Frankenstein. Here at Hastings, we celebrate scientists like Jennifer Dudna and think of them as role models for other scientists. Now there's still yet another line of defense, another line of oversight is a more positive way of putting it, and that's artists and humanists, like literary historians like Charlotte Gordon, who's joined us today, and novelists like Victor Laval, who, are both, who both have, have um, decided to spend some time with us and we're thrilled that you're here. We've invited artists and humanists um, because they're another important source of accountability and reflection. They can help us think about the purposes to which we should put science, about the kind of shared culture we want to build, about how we should relate to one another in a democracy, and what specific values should guide public policy. So I'm very much looking forward to their comments. I've, I've mentioned, in, in closing, I want to um, introduce the person who was behind all this. Um, I've already told you the Hastings Center has very senior staff, but we are also an incubator for up-and-coming talent, a place where tomorrow's superstars in bioethics get started. And that brings me to introducing Elizabeth Dietz, who's hiding in the library books. Liz is really the one responsible for today's program. She conceptualized the idea for today's session, and with the help, encouragement, and support of our director of research, Josephine Johnston, um, they identified the speakers, and Liz has been a driving force behind, the whole, uh, behind this all taking off. She came to us, I'm talking about getting your start, right, uh, being an incubator. Liz came to us right after graduating from Williams College. We were her first job after, after college. And um, we're very proud that she um, then went off, <laughs> we're sad, but proud that she went off to Arizona State University, which has one of the best PhD programs in science and technology studies in the world. And so she's come back from sunny Arizona to wet and gray garrison um, for this event. And while she was with us, the, t the years that she spent with us, she was a research assistant and program manager for a number of our projects, including one on human genome modification. So she's going to introduce the speakers. She's going to moderate the session, and so take, she's going to take it from here. Welcome. I'm thrilled to be here with you to have the kind of conversation that made the time that I spent here just incredible. Uh, this event, as Millie discussed, emerged out of the confluence of the 200th anniversary of the publication of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, and the kinds of questions that we spent the last several years asking about emerging genetic technologies such as CRISPR-Cas9, which essentially can be used to create precise edits in DNA. Uh, Charlotte Gordon, one of our panelists today, is going to situate the novel in its historical context. Victor Laval will uh, offer some analysis of the ways that we can look through it towards issues uh, that are uh, live in our contemporary discussions, such as police brutality and racism. Uh, and Josie Johnson is going to tie these ideas to the questions at the heart of what it means to be a parent in genetically modifiable times. Mm -hmm. Frankenstein has always been a timely book to think about. 
And it's particularly remarkable for its cultural penetrance. It's been adapted for the stage, for children, as comic books, uh, as a metaphor in biological research. You can search PubMed and Frankenstein comes up all the time uh, Mel, by Mel Brooks for my parents' particular sense of humor, which was shared with me at an age that can only be described as formative. Uh, the salience of this to our conversation, though, is that Frankenstein as a concept, as a figure, as a monster, means something to lots and lots of people. The proliferation of Franken words, the tendency to attach Franken to things that are deemed unnatural or perversions of science hints at this popular conception. You know what somebody means when they call something a Franken food, even if crucially, you don't necessarily think of that food as a perversion. It's this connect in part that we'll take up today, Frankenstein, or rather his creation, Frankenstein is the man, and the creature, the monster is unnamed in the text, has gotten quite the bad reputation. A closer read, though, finds an artifact of human creation that goes off into the world without significant malice, but hungry to learn things, to be around people, for food, gets in a little bit of trouble for this. He may have been created by Frankenstein, but he has a history and exists within a social context that shapes him as he does it. The Hastings Center's project on gene editing and human flourishing takes seriously these questions of technological shaping. It looks beyond whether gene editing will be safe and effective at producing particular therapeutic or enhancement related outcomes like new treatments for genetic conditions or the ability to select for an offspring's traits. Rather, the project asks what it would mean for these things to be possible in the real and flawed world in which we find ourselves. How might, or will, the ability to genetically shape ourselves affect our ability to flourish, to thrive as people, as individuals, as members of communities? What does this kind of newfound control uh, mean for the kinds of choices that we'll be confronted with? Gene editing isn't the first way that we've been able to exert control over the shaping of ourselves and our offspring. There's long been ways to make changes to genetics, to select for and against certain traits using assisted reproductive practices, and to use a number of everyday technologies to make ourselves see better, stay awake longer, move from place to place more quickly. But CRISPR, or gene editing technologies, just make these easier and faster and cheaper. And so we need to have conversations about what we should do in addition to what we can do. Each of today's speakers is concerned with the relationship between parents and children, between creators and the things that they create, and between authors and texts. Each treats these relationships as inextricable from the social context in which they occur, raising questions about suspect norms of racism, of sexism, of ableism. So without further ado, I will introduce them and let you hear from the people you're really here to see. Uh, Charlotte Gordon, who will be speaking first, is the Distinguished Professor of Humanities at Endicott College and the author of several books, including Romantic Outlaws, The Extraordinary Lives of Mary Wollstonecraft and Her Daughter Mary Shelley. Uh, which I always want to refer to as Mary's Wollstonecraft and Shelley, and since I have the mic, I get to make that dumb pun. Uh, this book won, among other, author, uh, among other honors, the National Book Critics Circle Award in Biography. Uh, it explores the intellectual heft, audacious scandals, and remarkable feminisms of a pair of mother-daughter literary giants who never really got to meet one another. Victor Laval, who will be speaking second, is the author of a number of novels, as well as an associate professor in the writing program at Columbia University. Uh, he is also the recipient of, among considerable other honors, the Guggenheim and Ford Fellowships. He's the creator and author of a comic book adaptation of Frankenstein, which you'll hear about today, uh, which is called Victor Laval's Destroyer, which rearticulates this familiar story as one of the relationship between the great, great, I meant to ask you how many greats? A number of greats, <laughs> granddaughter of Victor Frankenstein, a brilliant black female scientist, and her son who was killed by police violence. Our third speaker, Josie Johnston, who was my boss for many years and I am just thrilled to be back to hang out with, uh, is a research scholar and the director of research here at the Hastings Center. She's one of the principal investigators on our project, their project, ours, I'm gonna claim it, on our project on the implications of gene editing for human flourishing. Uh, she's an expert in the ethical implications of biomedical technologies related to human reproduction. And with a small amount of Googling, you can hear her speaking about them on public radio from here to New Zealand. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to open the floor to Charlotte. So I'm here really to provide you with a little bit of historical context about the novel Frankenstein. And for many of you, this may be an overview. Just looking at you, I feel like it might be an overview. So bear with me. I think we can get to some interesting things, even if you've heard some, some of this before. Uh, so I used to always teach Frankenstein as an English professor. And I'm ashamed to say, I didn't really know much about Mary Shelley. 
Um, but I didn't like I didn't really love the book because let's face it, there's not a lot of strong women in it. And so I would spend a lot of time kind of in apology mode with my students. And then I, you know, I didn't again, I then I'd move on to the next book. And I'm a highly educated individual, as you can probably tell, even looking at me. And I never knew that Mary Shelley was the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, who's the author of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Now, I think that's astonishing that I didn't know that because I really am, I mean, this is less about me than what training in English and history looks like um, or, or looked like. I hope I've changed this. Um, but I was really interested to find this out because I felt like it's very interesting to me that that this book that I felt kind of apologetic about as not having strong women in it was written by the daughter of maybe one of the most famous strong women of the 18th century, Mary Wollstonecraft. So out of that kind of question that I was asking, how did Mary Shelley come to write Frankenstein when her mother was cool, radical Mary Wollstonecraft, I went on a kind of obsessive journey to find out more about Mary Wollstonecraft, not thinking I was going to be writing a book. I mean, this is, you know, private obsession. So in this image that you're looking at, Mary Wollstonecraft is the one in white. She's actually pregnant with Mary Shelley in this image. And next to her is Mary Shelley, who I think is looking a little tired. At this point in her life, she's been through a lot. Um, this is where, this is again part of my personal obsession. Mary Wollstonecraft spent part of her formative years in Yorkshire in Northern England. And this actually is the window that she would gaze out of in the midst of depression. So why was she depressed? This is so interesting when you think about Mary Shelley's intellectual heritage. Um, she, Mary Wollstonecraft was born into a horrendous family. Her father was an abusive alcoholic and her mother was weak and a victim. And whenever Mary Wollstonecraft tried to defend her mother, her mother, as opposed to saying, thanks so much, said, stop it, Mary. Well, that's my translation. But um, she, she would just get mo in more trouble for standing up for her mother. Some of her earliest memories are of falling asleep on the threshold of her parents' door to protect her mother from her drunken father's rages when he came home. Uh, it's out of this kind of experience that Wollstonecraft developed a lot of her ideas about women in politics. Um, foremost among them was that marriage was a form of servitude for women and should be avoided at all costs. And she was correct in the 18th century. If you were a wife, let me, I see many of you nodding, but I'm going <laughs> to remind you. If you got married and you were a woman in the 18th century, you immediately surrendered all of your rights to property. You already had zero legal or political rights. And so, in fact, your husband's or your brother or your father's, their responsibility was to discipline you so that you wouldn't get out of control. Well, why? Well, as I always say to my students, this is a very interesting time period that Wollstonecraft is alive in. It's mid 18th century heading right into the American Revolution and then the French Revolution, and the English were anxious. And they felt like if families got out of control, counties would get out of control. If counties got out of control, town, you know, the entire kingdom would get out of control and England would turn into France and, you know, terrible things would happen. Kings would be beheaded, etc. So the one humane innovation of the 18th century was that, yes, of course a husband should whip his wife, but the whip should not be thicker than the thumb. And that's where we get the idea of the rule of thumb. I love that you all already know that. My students fall out of their chairs with amazement. You're nodding your heads. I want to just stay here for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> yes, so the rule of thumb. So Mary Wollstonecraft, as opposed to just kind of swallowing this, was outraged. And she could not feel that this was justice. And I always think that's interesting. What is it about someone during a time period that makes them revolt against the injustice of their time as opposed to just kind of obeying it and going with it. But she went against the tide and maybe one of the reasons was is that she had an ability to attract interesting people to her. I think she was very charismatic. And when she was 16 gazing out of this window, I'm pointing at what I can see, you can. Um, she met a couple that were living next door to her and they said, you know, we think that you might be interested in reading John Locke. 
Now, oh, again, I'm sorry to bring up my students again. When I say the name John Locke, their eyes roll back in their head with boredom. But in 1775, when Mary Wollstonecraft first reads John Locke, so also is John Adams, so also is Thomas Jefferson. He's considered so radical that he's not allowed at Oxford. People are not allowed to read him. Why? Because he sparked revolution. Why? Well, this little quote gives us uh, you know, an example of Locke's revolutionary ideas, like, we're all born with the same natural rights. We're born with a blank slate, people of all colors and men and women. At last, Wollstonecraft had found a philosophical underpinning for her feelings of injustice. And so just to hear Locke's words, he says the state of nature is one of equality, wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another. Wollstonecraft's life was, I think, quite literally changed by reading Locke. And she goes forward, and I, you know we don't have a lot of time, so I, I, will, I will do the condensed version of Wollstonecraft's life, though it's fantastic. Um, the, the options, of course, for a woman in the 18th century in England, if you didn't want to get married, were somewhat limited. If you didn't want to fall down the food chain and become a prostitute, uh, you could be a companion to a rich old person, which she was, and the old person was grumpy. And one of the stories I love about Wollstonecraft is this elderly rich person who had hired her had a reputation for terrorizing her hirelings, but Wollstonecraft intimidated her. And in fact, <laughs> it was Wollstonecraft who terminated their relationship. So the other things you could do is you could be a governess or you could be a teacher. And Wollstonecraft was both of those things. The school she starts was so radical, no one went to it. She thought things like, you know, <laughs> girls should think for themselves, you know, and run around outside and get strong and eat food and, you know, be basically <laughs> strong-minded people. And everyone was outraged. How can you think such a thing? If women use their girls, use their brains too much, their uterus will fall out. I mean, these are what the experts were saying. She's a governess, and I always love thinking who would hire Mary Wollstonecraft as a governess. Well, in fact, it's even better than that because the stupidest people in the world hired Mary Wollstonecraft as a governess. Rich English overlords in Ireland hire Mary Wollstonecraft sight unseen. She's so outraged that she's going to the occupation in Ireland that the first thing she does with her little charges is she walks them around the estate to show the children the poor Irish that her parents are oppressing. <laughs> Their parents are oppressing. It's classic Wollstonecraft. Again, that, you know, that obviously that job didn't last very long. <laughs> So she has a friend who shows some of her writing to a great radical publisher in London, Joseph Johnson. And the interesting thing about Wollstonecraft is she's reading John Locke and she's reading Rousseau. She's reading lots of interesting people, but she's a woman. So of course she hasn't been to school. So her writing style is this very interesting mix of informal and colloquial and highly formal. And so there's, there's sort of collisions of philosophical language with slang. Like, you'll be reading A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, and suddenly she'll say, what nonsense? You know, and I think, oh, there's Wollstonecraft. You can hear her voice. This is a picture of her right when she has um, come to fame as the author of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. And let me just say that when she published A Vindication, people did not say, gee, thanks. They said, you are a hyena in petticoats. You are a whore, and in fact, if you look up the word whore in the English dictionary, right up until, I think the end of the 19th century, it said, see Mary Wollstonecraft. Okay. <laughs> um, but what's interesting to me about this image is, first of all, it's so anti-whore. <laughs> She's really positioning herself as a male scholar. There's other images that we don't have time to look at of men during this time period in the 100 years before who have similar images of themselves holding a book. You know, she looks far more like a prime minister here than she does a marriageable young woman. And if you think about images of women from this time period, they have parasols, you know, they're on swings and their petticoats, like, no way. Um, this is just a fade, you can't see it, so we're moving past it. This is Wollstonecraft's, this is, this is a classic example of Wollstonecraft. It is time to effect a revolution in female manners. 
time to restore to them their lost dignity and make them as a part of the human species labor by reforming themselves to reform the world. Women's rights are human rights. This is where this idea begins. And you know, we can say that till we're blue in the face, it can sound so normal for us. For her time period, this was the kind of stuff that meant social exile, being pilloried, and being hated. When the French Revolution breaks out and all of the English fly home in terror, Wollstonecraft rushes to Paris so she can be the first female war correspondent. She arrives just in time for the execution of the king, which she kind of, she's kind of delighted by, actually. Though she doesn't think violence is good, but she does think aristocrats should be on the run. She does think poor people should come up. She does think, by the way, that women should be able to get divorced if their husbands are beating them, and that children should, in fact, um, be the woman's um, or custody could at least be shared because in the 18th century children were automatically a man's property. When she is in Paris, she falls in love with a sexy American. He seems to be her philosophical soulmate. Uh, they shack up, she gets pregnant, everything's great, she has a little baby named Fanny, not Mary, and then he abandons her. She gets super depressed. I'm gonna condense the story. She ends up, it's such a great story, but you'll just have to ask about it later. She ends up writing a book essentially about roaming around in nature to heal her broken heart that she ends up publishing. And in this book, um, she, she describes what it's like to smell the pines and see the waterfalls and how that heals her spirit. And the book is read by two young poets, one named William Wordsworth and another one named Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who say, wow, this idea of wandering around in nature and then writing about it is really a good idea. Maybe we should try it. I don't know about you, but this is not how I was taught about the origins of romanticism. But in fact, both men say, thank you, Mary Wollstonecraft. Well, all right, so um, when, when she publishes this book, um, it's read by a kind of rock star political scientist of the time named William Godwin, who I have a kind of um, schadenfreude feeling about that no one reads him anymore. At the time, he was the more famous person um, than Wollstonecraft. Uh, he falls in love with her. She does with him, though he's not as sexy as Gilbert. He's reliable. They get together. They've both written publicly against marriage. She gets pregnant. Oh no, what are they gonna do? She's already got this toddler she's dragging around with her. If she comes out as unmarried and gets married, what's gonna happen to toddler? But what about this baby? Ah, uh, they get married, all of their friends make fun of them. Here she is pregnant. They move to, well, we're gonna, they move to this really interesting neighborhood that we don't have time to discuss. They get married in this church that is still, if, you're, if you've been in London recently and you've taken the train from St. Pancras Station, this church is right across the street, Old Church, St. Pancras. They get married there, though neither of them really believe in God. She does a little bit. He's like, this is stupid. But they get married, um, and she gives birth, and they're perfectly happy. And then she dies, 10 days later, of childbed fever. That little baby she gives birth to is little Mary, who's going to go on and write Frankenstein 18 years later. Now, the point of all of this is this is the invisible backstory to Frankenstein. And this is what I can see many of you nodding. You already knew this story. Most people do not know that, in essence, Wollstonecraft is kind of the grandmother to Frankenstein. Little Mary, from the time she is about eight or nine years old, dedicates herself to living according to the ideals of her mother. Her brokenhearted father takes her to the graveyard where she learns to read on her mother's tombstone. You can't see the words there, but it says Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, which was little, Mary, little Mary's name before she gets together with Percy, author of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. These are Mary Shelley's first words, not truck, you know, or <laughs> mama, but vindication and woman. When she's, she's, when she's 16, um, she's decided I'm gonna be a radical, I'm gonna live according to my mother's ideals, and she conveniently meets Percy, 
who is already married, but who believes in marriage anyways. He's 20, she's 16. She takes him to her favorite place, her mother's gravestone. She says to him, Percy, I'm in love with you, which by the way, if you think about it, Jane Austen is writing right during this time period. You're certainly not supposed to be telling young men you're in love with them, let alone be alone with them in a graveyard. Anyway, he says, great, I'm glad you love me. She says, because you're married, we're going to have to run away together. It's like, okay, um, where should we go? She says, Paris, because that's where my mother went. They go to Paris. And what do they take with them? Not, you know, sexy lingerie, but a big pile of her mother's books, which they read to each other. Now, this is all actually kind of news, even in the circles of literary historians, in part because the Victorians were so upset by the real story of Mary Shelley that this is how they like to think of her, as kind of mild and demure, as opposed to the wild creature that she actually was. This is a Victorian reimagining of Percy, you'll notice, courting Mary, which is so not how it happened. Um, but I want to get to, I want to just finish so that we can move on, but there's so much history you should know. Um, she, she and Percy, when they come back home to London, no one will speak to them, including her own father, who was supposed to be against marriage. No, they live in poverty and social exile. Uh, she has a little child who dies. She has a second little baby, and he's beginning to cough a little. They think we need to get out of London for lots of complicated reasons that we can get into if we have time. They decide that they're going to go on a summer vacation with this individual, Lord Byron. They meet him in Geneva. This summer is famously known as the year without a summer because of one of those volcanoes has gone off the year before. You can't keep a bunch of romantics cooped up inside, even in a very lovely villa, which is still standing. This blurry picture I took like through the gates of the fence because it's privately owned, <laughs> but I stalked all around it. And in fact, the story that you've heard is true. They are, they, they, become bored and restless, and Byron says to them, we've read all the ghost stories that we have here in the villa. Who here do you think can write the scariest ghost story? So, and we know this because Mary tells us this about 20 years later. Byron sits down, starts to write a ghost story, and gets bored and goes back to writing about Byron. <laughs> Shelley. <laughs> Sits down, starts to write, you know, he gets, well, you can tell, you know, he gets bored, he starts writing about Shelley. Mary starts writing and doesn't stop for two years. Before she's 20, the book is published. It's published anonymously. Uh, everyone assumes it's written by a man. When they find out that it was written by a woman, yet again, they don't say, great. They say, what kind of monstrous female would have created this perversity? And so when she's asked to revise it, and now I'm truly coming to an end, when she's asked to revise it after Shelley has died and Byron has died, she tells a story that many people still think is true because she writes it in her introduction to the revised edition. And I just want to tell you, it's not true. She tells the story of Byron's challenge, and then she says, the men got right down to work, but I couldn't come up with an idea. But then, for, you know, a dream came to me. So I just wrote the dream down. Now, everybody who was there was, they kept journals. They wrote letters. And one of the men who was there had a giant crush on young Mary and wrote down everything she did. And he records how she started writing. We had the notebooks. She had no problems writing this book. So the question I always ask my students is, why does she tell that story? Well, if everyone is calling you a monster for writing this story, what better way to sort of solve the problem than to say, well, you know, it wasn't actually my idea. And then if you're a romantic, only the best romantics had cool dream visions anyway. So if you were in the know, she'd scored points. And if you weren't in the know, she'd kind of, she had attempted to restore her innocence. What does any of this have to do with my, my Original question, how did the daughter of the person who wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women write Frankenstein? I realized after I'd done all of this work, I realized that in fact, in many ways, 
of course, Frankenstein is a story, the first science fiction novel, whatever, we will talk about that as we go forward. But it's also a dystopian vision of a world without mothers, which Mary was an expert on, and a world without the influence of strong women. And essentially what Shelley is really saying is, look what happens when we don't take into account women, and during that time period, the values that women stood for, nurturing, parenting, education, et cetera. So in many ways, I think that the subtitle for Frankenstein should be Frankenstein, not modern Prometheus, but a world without mothers. Uh, so I'm going to come at this conversation from a little different angle from a uh, obviously a comic book angle, but from a, or from a creative writer's angle. Um, and <clears throat> explain that um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the influence of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein on my book, uh, Destroyer, which is not a retelling of Frankenstein, it's a continuation of Frankenstein, right? Because as all of you probably know, at the end of Mary Shelley's novel, uh, the monster sees Victor Frankenstein die on the boat, and then he says, I'm going to go off into the Arctic, and I'm going to set myself on fire and die. And what I decided was that um, he's not going to do that. Uh, uh, because now that his awful dad is dead, maybe he could actually become his own man. He set his, uh, he set his, uh, his daddy issues down. So uh, let's move on. And so my feeling was that he went off, and he decided, actually, I'm done with human beings, but that doesn't mean I'm done with life. And he decides to live in the Arctic, um, and, uh, uh, and then from there, I decided to make his way all the way as far as he could go from human beings. So when my comic begins, it begins in the Antarctic. Uh, but before I explain, uh, before I show you the first image, which is where we'll see the, the creation, the monster now, I would, also, I would only say that the uh, real impetus for this book was that uh, the, it, was the, it was 2015. The, in the spring of 2015, I taught Frankenstein in a class on first novels. Uh, to my students. Um, and then that summer, I'm always a little forgetful, but it may, have been the, it may have been the summer of Ferguson, it may have been the summer of something else, uh, uh, but uh, I was watching the news, and there was a mother on the news crying because, and I, I feel like it's a, a sad point that I can't remember which black kid it was who got killed by the police, but uh, she was crying and uh, saying, talking about the tragedy of losing her child. And I thought to myself while I was watching this, what would she do to get her child back? How far would she go to bring that child back? And having just taught Frankenstein, it was on my mind, and I thought those two things could go together actually quite nicely, right, as a sort of antithesis. Victor Frankenstein uh, has the desire to cross the threshold of death largely out of vanity, yeah, and scientific curiosity, to be generous. And that my scientist, <clears throat> my scientist would be a mother who wanted to cross the threshold of death to bring back the person she loved more than anyone else in the world. And how would that also make things different in the storytelling, right? So, but the first image, uh, before we got to her and her son, uh, we had to meet the monster. And so this is the monster, as, I, as we meet him on the first day, sitting on an iceberg in the Antarctic, um, looking like a King Lear with like an eight-pack, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, when, I, when we were talking, even on the level of like, thinking about the monster, one of the things I was trying to get back to in particular was the idea of the creation from the, no from the novel, not from popular culture. Yeah? So what I wanted to get away from for sure was the green skin, flat head, bolts in the neck, super sweetheart kind of uh, monster to the point where uh, like, uh, just I think last week uh, my kids, uh, one of their favorite movies right now to watch on Netflix on Saturday morning is Alvin and the Chipmunks Meet Frankenstein. That, to me, is how degraded the creation has become. I mean, it's lovely for them, but it's horrible, right? Uh, and the movie's horrible. Um, so I wanted to go back to that monstrous creation, the one who kills children and women and whoever, comes, who, whoever it comes across. And so when we were coming up with what the creature should look like, uh, I sent two photos to the artist. Uh, one was the statue of uh, Michelangelo's Moses and then Iggy Pop. <laughs> and so I wanted Iggy Pop Moses for my monster. And he really came up with it. It was really kind of amazing, yes? Um, so and nonetheless, we meet him there in the Antarctic. And uh, we quickly see him. Uh, he's living among the, um, 
He's living among the mink whales and the leopard seals and all this kind of thing. But, uh, and he's swimming with them. And then a whaling vessel uh, pierces the mink whales that he's befriended and destroys them right there in front of him. And the monster is reminded that humanity is still a scourge on the planet and is still going to draw him back in. So he, uh, uh, in his rage, he climbs onto the boat, uh, that, uh, onto the uh, Japanese fishing vessel that speared the... Uh, the uh, whales, and uh, I felt like if you're getting bored, here's a nice heart coming out of someone's chest, being punched out of someone's chest by the monster. Yes, but I wanted to, like, as I said, I wanted to get back to that idea of two things that were, are vital to the book. One is the idea of rage, yes, and the idea of rage at the death of one's loved ones. And then the other thing you can see down here in the corner is a little cell phone, uh, because technology, as it has to be in a Frankenstein story, uh, or any kind of inspira- inspired by Frankenstein story, has to become a part of things. So from the beginning, we're seeing the ways that like uh, rage and technology are vital to the story and uh, uh, begin to pop up throughout the tale. Yeah. Um, so all that happens. So uh, the there's a Greenpeace vessel that is, you know, has been trying to stop the whalers uh, and is right nearby and sees the creature come on board and then sees the creature as it's going down the stairs here, just starts wrecking shop on all the, the, the sailors on the ship, essentially just starts killing everyone on the ship, right? And the Greenpeace folks who are on, I didn't include every panel, but the Greenpeace folks, folks who are watching this are like, oh my goodness, what's, what's going on? What should we do? And then to make matters worse, after it blows up that ship, it then swims over to the Greenpeace folks. And it's just like, uh, and they're all like, uh, look, we don't kill whales. We're good people. Please, you know, we're, we're, we're nice. We're, we're trying to stop that kind of slaughter. And then the creature kills them too. Yes? Because one of the things I wanted to get at uh, was the idea that I think is toward the end of the Frankenstein novel, which is that just because you think you are a good person doesn't mean you deserve to be spared. Yes, and one of the things that's very difficult, I think, for people when they talk about Frankenstein in particular, Mary Shelley's novel in particular, is that what people remember, and I think part of the reason why I say Boris Karloff, uh, from the beginning of his movie, why he decided to make his Frankenstein like a six-year-old was the way he described it when he was coming up with his character. No, no speech, uh, very childlike, was because I think, broadly speaking, people have a really hard time with the idea of rage, yes, and have a really hard time with the idea that... Um, they might be the uh, recipient or the uh, uh, focus of one's justifiable rage. And so as a result, I think that aspect of the monster is most often erased from the novel. We dislike Frankenstein, uh, but maybe we uh, cut some slack to, um, maybe we cut some slack to the creature here or there, and we just ignore that he's killing little kids and women, yeah? Um, But uh, so, uh, but word gets back to this uh, secret organization who, um, who have been tracking the monster forever. Um, and this is the, is this the light? I'm trying to figure out this is the light. Uh, and so we see here, I was trying to do a, night, a fun little thing. So word gets back that the creature's coming. And if you look at the first two, will this go? Let's... Oh, it doesn't go on the screen. Oh, where do I do it? Just to... I can just tell. Okay. Um, well, they said to use this, so that's why I was... So um, what I was trying to do was, uh, number one, anyone who remembers the movie The Right Stuff, there's this scene when uh, the Russians go up, and you see the feet running, and it's Jeff Goldblum running, and he says, the Russian, it's called Sputnik. And so I wanted to nod to that, and this idea of, again, exploration across, um, across uh, boundaries that are not meant to uh, be crossed. Um, and then we meet the director, the woman who is the head of this organization. And if she looks in any way like a writer named Ayn Rand, you would be right to be noticing that comparison. Yes. And so she is the great villain of my book uh, uh, overall. Yes. Um, uh, so, I've, so I'm just walking you through meeting the major characters, and then I talk about like how this all comes together. So we've met the creature. We've met the sort of uh, the um, the forces of the state. Right? Uh, and then the last uh, two people we have to meet are Josephine and then Akai. Uh, and uh, Josephine in particular is who we're going to meet here. Josephine, uh, this is uh, the great, 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 whatever it is, granddaughter of Edward Frankenstein. In my storyline, Edward is the only person who survives the rage of the creature. So my storytelling idea was 
Uh, he decides Europe has been pretty bad for our family, so why don't I go to the Americas? And he goes to the Americas, and as can happen once you get to the America, people start meeting and cross-cultural this, this, and this, and then all of a sudden, who we have is this black woman named Josephine Baker, Dr. Josephine Baker, who is the, uh, who is the greatest uh, nanotechnologist uh, in the United States. Um, I, I decided to name her Josephine Baker, in part for the pleasurable laugh of people who understand, obviously, who Josephine Baker is, but also because what is less known about Josephine Baker is that when she lived in France, she was a great supporter of the resistance against the Nazis, and when she came to the United States, she was a great supporter of the civil rights movement here, and I wanted to honor not only uh, her, her name and her legacy as an artist, but to also honor the sort of steely spine of who she actually was, or who else she was, this fighter, yes? So Josephine Baker is, a, is, a, is this brilliant scientist who lives, in, uh, who lives in Montana, working at the University of Montana. Uh, she lives there now because she has left Chicago behind, because her son, Akai, was sh murdered by the Chicago police in Chicago. Uh, and she's, gone, she's come back here. What you're seeing in this moment, this panel is down in her secret lab in her cabin. Um, we tried to make the inside of the lab, if you look at the back of it, it looks very much like Frankenstein's lab out of the James Whale movies. Um, and she's decided to use her abilities with nanotechnology to revive her murdered son, Akai, uh, and bring him back. Uh, and then the story will essentially become how these different uh, versions of the Frankenstein family legacy are sort of brought together and how they battle each other, but that battle is on some level actually a conversation of, again about the idea of rage. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the, one of the things I was thinking about was the ways that the monsters rage, you see that heart punch and all this sort of stuff, and it makes a degree of a... Uh, um, Humorous fun, or at least to me it does. Uh, uh, and it's kind of exciting and, and uh, gruesome and all this kind of stuff. But there's a way that uh, the, the monster's uh, rage is considered somewhat understandable because he's fighting back on behalf of the, of the, animals, of the animal kingdom, of the mink whales that are destroyed by the, the, the fishing vessel. And I've found lots of readers who cut him a lot of slack mm -hmm. as a result. But Josephine is also enraged because her son was murdered. And one of the things I wanted to explore in the book was the ways that female rage is perhaps the most unacceptable form of emotional release that we still have in this country, in the world, yes? And that Josephine brings her son back, but not because she just wants to have tea and cookies with her son. She brings her son back and makes him into this sort of nano super being because she now wants to go and burn down the entire United States. She wants to kill everyone and everything in this country because this country took her son. And what we explore in the book to some degree is the ways that she is regularly punished for those feelings. Whereas the creature is regularly, um, if not applauded, understood and um, forgiven, yes? And that the story for me uh, bec becomes, the thing that I took most out of uh, Mary Shelley's novel uh, was, um, I mean, along with all its brilliance and all this stuff, was that idea at the end of the novel that when the creature goes on his tear and begins to kill uh, all those who Victor Frankenstein loves, he does not do it, I would say, out of a, because he's a monster or anything like that. He does it because he has been spurned, his love has been turned away, and he has been taught that he is not a being considered worthy of love by this man. And I wanted to write a comic about a woman and her child who might also feel that way about this country mm -hmm. and how that might be the, how their rage and their desire to destroy might be just as justifiable as the monsters, even if by the end, you hope that they won't make that choice. Uh, I think I'll just stop there. Thank you all very much. Can you bring it back a little bit here to, um, to the work that we do and that I do? Because um, I do think the connections are actually pretty deep, um, if not always so apparent. Um, I'm going to say just that I think it's just one of the beautiful things about this year, this 200th anniversary of Mary Shelley's book has been the opportunity to celebrate her 
um, someone who wrote a book and published a book when she was 18, which I don't know who did that. Has anyone done that? <laughs> um, uh, that, that, you know, is as powerful today as it, as it may, I don't know what it was like at the time for people to read it. I mean, they were sort of horrified, but um, is this incredibly powerful today? And it's just so inspiring to celebrate um, a woman like that. I'm going to skip over this because we heard already about the work that we do here. But just to say that, um, and, I'm, and I'm going to put up that, that Boris um, Karloff uh, picture, just to sort of say that what I'm going to say today in some ways connects more with the way that Frankenstein exists in our culture as, a, as, a, as almost a meme, right? Like as an idea, as a notion, as a character. Um, and in, in, the, in many ways, what that person is, if we, as we've heard that image, that meme, it's inaccurate to the actual novel. Um, he's not, um, he's, well, first of all, when I, before I read the book, I actually thought Fra Frankenstein was the name of the monster, right? So, like, I don't know, if you don't have to admit that you also had that problem. Um, but there's so much, this has such a life far and away from the actual novel that we might make that kind of confusion. And it's also a word that we use today to describe all these other things, right? Franken foods, this is a Franken mouse. There was a lovely article in Science Magazine at the beginning of the year where they like listed about 30 words that begin Franken something, you know, Franken whatever, Franken corn, Franken you name it. Um, and as it, the word, like imagine inventing a character in a story who ends up being able to be used 200 years later as a word to signify something that pushes boundaries, that's potentially um, sort of an unstable, um, potentially sort of a, a wrong, like disgusting thing. And so this is the Frankenmouse. And so in the sense in which the, the term and the book be exist in this space, then they're of relevance to people like us who spend all of our time thinking about new things in science and medicine and how to use them. We come across this Franken, uh, Franken mouse, Franken word, and this idea of like what happens when we create new kinds of beings, new kinds of things, and we merge boundaries and we cross boundaries. Those ideas come up all the time in our work, looking at science and medicine. As Millie said earlier, um, the character of Victor Frankenstein in the novel, and he's not a doctor, we actually also make that mistake, um, that he's not a doctor, he's a student, right? He's a horrible scientist, okay? He has, um, he's literally making this creature in his dorm room, basically, in his student housing, um, he has no funding, so he doesn't have any money to get a nice, nice thing. So he goes out and robs graves in order for his material. So, like, if he had had some funding, he might have had like the money to make something that wasn't so repulsive um, visually. He doesn't tell anybody what he's doing. So, a scientist today would be required to like apply for funding, probably at least disclose to the institution they worked at what they're doing. People would look at it and say, you know, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Maybe you should make this change. None of that. He did it all in secret, right? Scientists working in secret is like almost the opposite of what we require today of scientists. Um, and he also had no oversight. It wasn't like there was some sort of body, like a review board looking at his work and overseeing it. He was using um, electricity to galvanize, to create, to give life to this thing. People working with those kinds of substances today usually are subject to laws in addition to whatever their institutional rules would be. And then, uh, he, oh, and by the way, he also did this work on no sleep, right? So, like, he went into a kind of feverish, um, manic state for days and didn't sleep and then created this thing in that time and then like flicked the switch or like brought it to life um, under in a situation where he was wholly unable to deal with it which we wouldn't allow anyone to do either you know we don't even like our doctors really to just like work night you know two days in a row so he was in this terrible state and then he created something that he was immediately repulsed by he abandoned it and he warned no one like multiple times in the book, there are moments where he could warn somebody that oh, I unleashed this monster, or actually that woman who's standing trial for murder didn't kill that person, my monster did. Oh, well, she just takes the fault. He does nothing right. And actually he's a really annoying character. Um, 
after a while because he just is constantly doing the wrong thing. So he's a horrible, horrible scientist, really kind of a disappointing person. I don't think Mary Shelley was writing a critique of science. It's not like there'd been all this science that had been happening in this institutional way separate and there'd been these, you know, bombs created or anything. This was a critique, I think, mainly of, of men and of, um, of, of Western culture and pro what was sort of deemed to be progress. And it was also just like a really funny story. Like if you're a science fiction writer and you want to write about science, it's hard not to use this kind of setup of like science gone wrong, right? So it's like, it's just a, a, a structure. But today it has that resonance, that meaning of something that uh, science gone wrong. And so this book came out, Frankenstein, annotated for scientists, engineers, cr and creators of all kinds. This is a republication of the text with annotations designed for science and engineering students, really. Um, there's some information about the book here. And it has seven essays, I think, about the book. And I, I wrote one of the essays. And the theme I was given for the, for the essay was responsibility. Now, it's pretty obvious the ways in which responsibility is a theme in Frankenstein, where you can at least read that into it. Um, but Victor Frankenstein utterly fails to anticipate the harm that could result from his curiosity, and he absolutely fails to be responsible for what he creates. He then also fails to be responsible to it, right? So in the book, the, the monster is an it, really. I think we quickly in our minds think of it as a him. But he, he has no responsibility to it. The monster comes pleading, please make me a mate. I'm so lonely, I'm so sad. And, and he, he says yes, but then he doesn't do it. Um, so he is utterly um, irresponsible insofar as to the creation, to the thing, to the being, to the thing that he's created. And the other thing that Shelley does in the book is she explores the effect of all of this on, on him. On, on Victor Frankenstein. So it's not just that he's not responsible for what he does or that he's not responsible to it, he actually kind of suffers this irresponsibility. He physically manifests it and he, he sleeps for days, he wanders aimlessly, he, he's sort of sick, he's made sick by his inability um, and refusal to, to look after it. And in that way, it's a book that also explores the impact on the self of the kinds of um, mistakes that Frankenstein makes. So a book like that would be in my head um, now when something like this would happen. And so what you see here, it doesn't look like a, a monster brought to life. But these are the two papers that, that announced the invention of CRISPR-Cas9, which is this newest gene editing tool. Uh, published in 2012 and 2013 by r groups of researchers. You can't, you know, I don't expect you to be able to read any of this, but like, there's not just one author of any of these things. Um, and it was the, the, these papers signaled the, the coming true of something that people had been trying to do for a long time, which was once we figured out that DNA was this double helix, that we understood the structure of, of DNA, the idea of making changes to it was all, always there, right? Always there is this enticing um, prospect, and that's partly because there are single gene disorders that cause huge amounts of suffering. And so the idea being, that it would be great not just to know what gene caused that disease, but to actually be able to change it. Not just treat it, but undo or re rewrite the effects of that gene. And so CRISPR-Cas9 was this, not the first way to do it, but, the, but by far and away the most effective, the quickest, the easiest, the cheapest way to do changes in genetics that had ever, um, that had ever existed. And I'm going to put up, this is a picture of it, though so this is actually what it, it's not obviously an actual picture, it's an artist's representation or a diagram of CRISPR. So this is as close as you can get to like seeing the monster, if you like. Um, and it's uh, the, the sort of, um, I'm not a scientist, right? So like you're, not go you're gonna forgive me for this explanation, but I feel like maybe most of us aren't scientists, so this will probably do for now. But basically, <laughs> the green blob, the thing that's blobby shaped, um, is the Cas9, right? In the name CRISPR, Cas9. Cas9, and it's an enzyme, and it can cut DNA. So it's often referred to as a kind of molecular scissors. And the purple thing that loops up is a piece of guide RNA. Its job is to guide the blob to the place on the genome where the, where the cut is going to be made. And when you cut the genome like that, it can repair itself really quickly, but if you intervene in the repair, you can actually switch the DNA. So you can put different DNA in there. 
So that's the green thing there is on the right is a little bit of donor DNA that's now going to be in the genome. So that's just sort of essentially how it works. And it was actu it's actually um, something that is, exists in bacteria. It's in a bacterial immune system function, what bacteria do when they get viruses. So everyone gets viruses, right, not just us. Um, bacteria do, and this was their mechanism for responding to their immune mechanism. And it turns out that it can be harnessed to cut any DNA. And initially that wasn't totally clear, but when it became clear that you could use this in mammals, for mam in mammalian cells, then this whole sort of world opened up. You can use it also to make multiple changes, which was not something you could previously do. And of course you can use it in any human cell, right? any animal cell, but also any human cell. So when this was first published, this work, there was massive, massive um, interest inside of science, but also immediately outside of science. It's one of those discoveries that cross right out into the public mind immediately. These are science e journals, but they're public facing journals writing about, with this on their covers, writing about um, what this will do, release the bottleneck in science, you know, just, and sort of supercharge a whole lot of work that was going on. And then the other one's a little bit more of a mix. There's no hunger, no pollution, no disease, and the end of life as we know it. Like, if you invent something where that's the title of your, how they um, talk about your invention, you know that you've made a bit of an impact. Um, but also people immediately started thinking, well, hang on a minute, this would enable us to do this thing that we've been kind of freaked out that we might one day be able to do, which is change our descendants. And so you get covers like this, you know, with babies on them, <laughs> signalling this whole design of babies kind of concern. Here are two of the people credited with the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9, Feng Swang from the um, Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, and Jennifer Doudna at UC Berkeley. It's one of those inventions that has more than one um, sort of author, um, but these two are probably the most prominent of those credited with its invention. Now one of the really interesting things about Jennifer Doudna aside from her sort of just, she's just an amazing human generally and a very interesting career, sort of toiled in the dark for a long time and then suddenly burst into the public mind with this work, is that as soon as, this, as, soon as she announced her invention, she participated in this group that met in, um, let me see, where did they meet? Napa, um, and published a, this article calling for um, an international discussion about how best to use this invention. So here's a scientist who was immediately thinking, how is this going to be used? What is going to happen with this? And instead of thinking, I'll just figure that out by myself, she knew that this needed to be discussed across international boundaries and by people who outside of science. And so in this paper, they call for various things, including like um, a moratorium on sort, certain uses. But the, the really important thing I think about the article was she publicly went out and said, other people need to weigh in on this. This is not just for me to shepherd. And that's a really important step. Know how different that is from Victor Frankenstein. One of the main things, of course, that people like Jennifer Doudna are worried about with the use of CRISPR-Cas9, one of the things you should be worried about, is whether it's safe. Right? This is a really obvious concern with any new invention. Is it safe? And then a secondary question would be like, does it even work? Like, does it do the thing that we think it does? So those, in our discussions, we call that safety and efficacy. Those are two things that the FDA is very comfortable looking at. Though they don't always get it right, but they, they're really much better than no FDA, by the way, because um, that's on some people's minds. Um, so they're worried about safety and efficacy. And there's a lot of stuff in place in the US and other countries to think about safety and efficacy. But these scientists also wanted to talk about CRISPR and wanted to get other people to think about it because they were worried about other things, non-safety concerns. What does it mean to be able to change future generations, to make permanent alterations? What does it mean to be, for humans to be doing this kind of thing in animals, in, a non other, in insects and other organisms? Those are not safety concerns. They're like, even if it was safe and effective, we might still have some questions. And that's what inspired the Hastings Centre to get kind of into this stuff, because we're like, oh, we really like talking about that other stuff that people are sometimes a little uncomfortable talking about. And, um, oh dear, my slide has got a mistake on it. You can't see the title. So this, this is, if you go to our website, you'll see a, a project that I've, draw, I've cut off the whole name of the project here on my slide. 
but um, it's called Gene Editing and Human Flourishing. And we use human flourishing as a way to try to talk about things beyond safety and efficacy. And so one of the things that this project has led to is a book that's coming out next year. I really hope that it has a better cover than this thing that I made. Yes. <laughs> this is like what, why, you, you know, this is my monster. This is like my really cheap, I didn't even want to pay for a really nice image I got off the internet of a book coming out next year called Human Flourishing in an Age of Gene Editing in which we invited about 20 people who we identified various ways to write about what else they think is at stake in a time when you can make these kind of changes. You know, we're inspired by CRISPR, but we're also thinking about genetic selection, various other ways in which we um, can sort of shape who we are. And a whole bunch of them, not all at all, but about a third or a quarter of the essays in this book are really about parenting, about using parenting as and, and the creation of children as a, as a place to explore some of the deepest discomforts we might feel about this. And in those essays, well, I, I wrote one of them, um, but other, there are other very, very smart people who wrote others. Um, and we're talking about this tension often in parenting between creating, shaping, right? Like you don't just, you know, teaching your kid manners, shaping who they are, but also accepting them, wondering and being open to wonder, being welcoming of who they are. And this inherent tension in parenting is what mo is really motivating a lot of the work in the book. And these are questions that you've probably seen if you've read articles like this in the Wall Street Journal about whether or not it's ethical to choose your baby's eye colour. Right? It's not a question about safety or efficacy. This is a question about what kinds of control it's good to have over the future generations. And it's the kind of um, questions that are raised by an article like this from the Atlantic, will editing your baby's genes be mandatory? Which starts to get at some of the social forces that might shape or sort of pressure people to feel like they have to make a change in their future child, even if it's not something they really want to do. So in the book, we are exploring both the kind of in, um, internal motivations that you might, people might have or the resistances that one might have to making changes over who our children are, but also some of the social forces, including you know, racism, or, um, sexism, um, ableism, that bear down on prospective parents as they consider how much control to have over future generations.